Good afternoon, my name is Richard Bennett and I'd like to give you a talk on the subject of captive breeding and habitat enrichment uh, from my perspective living on the Kenyan coast in East Africa. Uh, now my name is Richard Bennett, I'm the owner of Mida Butterfly Farm and since 1993 we've been exporting live pupae uh, mainly to the American market. We have also supplied uh, Europe and the UK uh, but mainly America at the moment. Normally we do something like about um, 100,000 pupae a year. Obviously this year has not been so good and last year was terrible uh, because of Covid although we do expect everything to pick up again. Uh, right now we're on about 50% of what we would be exporting so things are looking up again. Now what we do is um, we do the initial breeding in flight areas here. Uh, we do a lot of research on the species that we think will be acceptable in the international flight areas and we, it often takes several years for us to actually get a species up to being on the market. So once we do have that, then we will show a whole load of our farmers exactly how to breed that particular species. And they will do the breeding in their own farms, normally fairly small farms, but uh, they will do their breeding in many different areas of the country. And those will be sold to us uh, so that we can make a mix from different areas of the country uh, to make one package that then gets exported. Uh, there's probably, at the moment, I'd have thought about 500 farmers around the country. Uh, we train some of them in a, an informal basis and then, of course, they will actually train their family members and their friends and so eventually you get a lot of people that are doing, doing the breeding. The areas that we actually have farmers uh, on the coast, we have farmers in the southern Kaya forests which are normally at low altitude on the Kenyan coast, so hot and tropical. We've got our own forest farmers here close to Watama, which is called the Arabuko Sakoki. So we have a whole ring of farmers around there. Well, that's quite a big forest, it's about 400 square kilometres. So not surprisingly, uh, we do have quite a few people around there. We've got farmers in the Shimba Hills, which is about 400 metres altitude. Um, and that extends, it starts, basically it starts about 20 kilometres inland, facing the coast. So you've got a bit more rainfall there and it's a bit cooler up there. Much further inland we've got a farmers in a place called the Taita Hills, which is a very special sort of habitat. Uh, the Taitas go up to about 2,000 metres, so it's, it's almost a temperate climate up there. And then finally we have farmers over in Kakamega Forest, which is in the west of Kenya and that is basically a Guinean Congolian rainforest. It's the only big patch uh, that we have in Kenya. It's very similar to Uganda and going across into um, DRC and West Africa. So we get various species from there that we would not get down here. The result of having pupae from all these different habitats and at different altitudes, different seasons, is that year round we get a good mix that we're able to send out. And uh, for instance, the American market requires pupae all year round, so we're able to satisfy that. Currently we've got about 50 species on the go. Um, some become common at different times of the year, so you, throughout the year you're getting a different mix of species available. Um, species that we do have, uh, we have around about eight papilios, we've got about six uh, graphium, which are the sword tails, and around 30 of various nymphalids, such as Hyperlimnus, the Caraxes, Euxanthi, etc. 
and a few silk moths that we managed to put in as well. Now, the captive breeding, um, this is basically referring to completing the whole life cycle in captivity. Uh, often it's a lot more difficult than merely rearing uh, from eggs obtained from wild-caught females, i.e. without the active, captive mating. That's the tough bit, often. Uh, an example, for instance, in the Caraxi species, which are very powerful canopy flyers, they will happily lay eggs in a small uh, shade net sleeve that's put over a branch of the food plant. They could not possibly mate in that small area, but if you manage to collect um, a female in one of those uh, bait and traps, then you can put her in one of those and she'll actually lay quite a lot of eggs in there within the next few days. Normally if you want to mate something like that, then you will need a minimum area of 3 by 5 metres and 2 metres high, suitably set up, and then maybe you'll get those species mating. Uh, so generally, yeah, you need more room for courtship mating than you do for egg laying. And understanding those requirements is absolutely essential for cage design, flight area design. Um, coming on to flight areas, now then, it's a compromise. Flight area design is a compromise between what your plants want and what the butterflies need. We're in the coastal tropics here, so uh, temperatures are going up to 35 centigrade, which means that heat and dehydration are number one problems, and those can drastically reduce your butterfly longevity, whereas your plants tend to be less susceptible to this. We have a cage that we do most of our breeding work in of about 25 by 24 by 4 metres tall. And with the use of shade netting in various thicknesses, that reduces the heat, the heat build-up inside. So if you have that in conjunction with mist sprays and drips, then you can create a reasonable environment for the butterflies so they're able to survive in there. Um, when you do that, you find that often the plants will not flower because they need higher light intensity in order to flower. So the way you get around that one is that you have potted plants and you move your potted plants inside and out depending on whether they are flowering or not. Um, this applies also to uh, food plants for the butterflies for egg laying. Now, what I've found over the years is that if you visit any of these flight areas, um, commercial flight areas, then you will find a whole load of the butterflies will be sitting up against the windows or against the side of the cage and basically just wasting their lives in a corner. Um, some places you find that it's a really significant proportion of the, the butterflies that they're trying to display just are not doing anything. So it's a waste. Uh, the butterflies themselves, they beat themselves up in the corners so they get broken wings. They live um, only for a fraction of their normal lifetimes because of course they get dehydrated while they're sitting up. But, so it's not um, an ideal situation for display. If you want to farm the butterflies, then that sort of behaviour is counterproductive. Um, a butterfly in its natural state, there are no real physical uh, constraints or barriers to where it goes. The only the only constraints are behavioural constraints. So a flight area should mimic those behavioural constraints of the butterfly, which will then allow the thing to perform in a normal manner, allow it to feed, allow it to mate, and allow it to lay eggs. And that is the function of cage design. It should take into account those uh, attributes of the butterfly so that they are capable of uh, producing a good number of eggs. 
to do that you've got to use shading you have to use different materials and you've got to know where to put your plants uh, in order to elicit the correct responses from these things typical illustration is a butterfly that's called Papilio fidicaphilus uh, the emperor swallowtail occurs in east and central Africa we found in the Usambara mountains of northern Tanzania that if we put these in a normal 3 by 5 and 2 meters tall cage the things would more or less beat themselves to death in about 3 days they'd die and they wouldn't lay many eggs on the other hand if you put them in a 5 meter circular cage again 2 meters tall they go round and round in circles they don't hit themselves on the sides and if you put a food plant along their flight path then you will get plenty of eggs on it so that is a pretty good example of what you can do with flight cage design. Final thing to remember about flight cages is that they've got to keep the predators out. Now then, here in tropical Africa we have got the lot. We've got everything from um, ants and spiders and centipedes and hunting wasps all the way through big lizards, small lizards, bush babies, monkeys, rats, mice, you name it. Shade netting is pretty good, but it does need maintenance, so you've got to keep an eye on what's going on, otherwise you will have massive losses. Okay, now turning to habitat enrichment, this is where the outgrowing model that we use with all our farmers really helps. Main problem in Kenya, the main ecological problem, is that uh, we've got uh, habitat change going on. Uh, we've got what happens is forest get, tends to go down to open woodland which then tends to go to scrub this is due to charcoal production and subsequent small-scale agriculture uh, latterly things have been compounded by climate change uh, water towers that, that we formerly had in forested areas are now drying up so generally you're getting a biodiversity loss I've seen the climate change effects in my 40 years here. I used to collect um, Aphidicephalus, the Emperor Swallowtail, in the coastal Kayas. Uh, they disappeared from there about 25 years ago. Shimba Hills, I used to get them, disappeared from there about 20 years ago. And now my stock for that species needs to come from the tighter hills. Much cooler place. Uh, still got good rainfall. Uh, and the butterflies do very well up there. But... Uh, there's other species that are doing the same thing. I've spoken to my farmers and they say, yeah, things were a lot wetter and there were a lot more butterflies around 15 years ago than there are today. Um, the tighter hills, by the way, is also the stronghold of uh, the Papilio desmondii titer, which is an endemic rarity. Thankfully, according to my farmers, this is highly seasonal which is why often you don't see the things. Normally only flies in June to August after the rains, but it, then it's frequently seen on forage edges and has actually taken to laying eggs on cultivated citrus in people's uh, small holdings. Uh, this obviously would help increase their local range in numbers under favourable uh, climatic conditions. So it's a bit of good news for that particular subspecies. From the butterfly's point of view, and from our point of view, the use of local farmers to do most of our breeding is favourable in at least three ways. First, they're breeding on site, normally very close to a forest edge. They release old stock that they cannot sell to us, or they rebreed it. So they're adding to the local populations. Secondly, the parasites and the predators get a much lower percentage of uh, potential food than they would do in natural conditions, so therefore you get higher numbers uh, of butterflies. And finally, they plant the food and nectar plants all over their own land, thereby creating metapopulations that can actually help bolster the strongholds um, in hard times. A very good example of this that I was working on a lot is a butterfly called uh, Hyperlimnus usumbara, the usumbara diadem, a beautiful forest species, much in demand for exhibitions. Uh, we started research on this in the 80s. 
Um, it's a, an uncommon localised species. Food plant wasn't known. It took us three years of mainly wasted time to locate the food plant, locate the colonies that existed, and to actually get that up to export standard. Um, now then, once we showed the farmers how to do that, then obviously the amount of food plant that was being produced uh, was increased because it grows very well. The food plant is called Urera zanzibarica. It's a tropical nettle, basically a creeper, uh, but very easily grown from cuttings. So everybody is growing cuttings, and as a result of that, planting the cuttings around their own um, small farms, then it means that the actual range of this particular butterfly I would say has increased especially during the rainy season. Its big problem is that it's a behaviourally it's a dark forest species it really does not like coming out into the bright sunlight so you don't get uh, a distribution of females for instance from one increasingly isolated forest patch to another. Um, and as a result of that, genetically, uh, that species must be getting less diverse. So what we do is we actually have a proportion of the species that we breed. We set those aside, we hatch them out, and we will send those to bolster the populations in the forest patches that we know already have uh, um, a colony. So in our own small way, we are trying to keep these things going. Um, I think that will do for the moment. So um, that's it for the moment. If there's any questions about that, then um, I can answer them on the 12th of June. So good afternoon for now. Thank you.